Hello, good evening, everybody. Good to uh, good to see you again, even though I can't see you, of course. Uh, welcome back to Sussex Wildlife Trust TV, uh, broadcasting again from behind my sofa for the first time in a while. Uh, so this is our uh, ongoing program of uh, online talks, which we've been doing for oh, over a year now, I'd imagine. It's been a long time. Um, now, I haven't said this for a while, but hopefully uh, I'm going to be joined tonight by Dr. Barry Yates. Barry, are you out there? Good evening from a chilly Rye Harbour. I was over in Rye. It's a bit cold over there, is it, out in the uh, Far East? Yeah, I've got to keep my hat on today. Okay. Yeah, we've done, uh, done quite a few of these, Barry, haven't we? It's been, it's been a while since I've seen you on the... Uh, on the screen like this, but uh, it would yeah, it does, be a does, year now. Has it been a year? It does seem a long time since the last one, and I've, I've done a few face-to-face -face talks. Wow, so they were a bit they were a bit scary. I've done so many of these now. I'm getting recognised in the street when I go out and about. It's uh, which is pretty scary, as you imagine. Um, and uh, this evening's talk has been organised by our Eastbourne Regional Group, and so I'm going to welcome uh, from that group uh, Janet Knott. Janet, are you are you with us? I am, yes. Evening, Janet. Good to see you. And how's Eastbourne yeah. tonight? Is it, uh, is it as chilly as Rye Harbour? Uh, battle's quite cold, yes. Oh, oh, battle, yeah. <laughs> you're not wearing any woolly hat, you see, can't be, can't be too I'm cold. I'm not, no. <laughs> so, uh, if you haven't been to one of these talks before, and I'm sure you have, firstly, why not? And, uh, and secondly, uh, we tend to uh, go on for about, about an hour. Now, Barry informed me just now, he has no idea how long his talk's going to last. So uh, I'm certainly I'll appear after uh, after about 45 minutes, Barry, and uh, I'll give you the nod. But uh, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Maybe it's 20 minutes. Maybe it's uh, two hours. So uh, and throughout the talk, um, if any questions for Barry, you've got to take some questions, Barry. Yeah, I'm happy to through the uh, messaging. Okay. So uh, any uh, little Q and A button on the screen there. I've got my, my little bit of paper here. Any questions for Barry? I'll jot them down. And I'll reappear at the end and uh, we'll ask Barry some questions all about uh, all about his talk and, and uh, trail cameras. So I'll see you at the end and I'll hand over now to Janet to introduce tonight's speaker. Thanks, Michael. Um, welcome to this evening's webinar and thanks again to the Sussex Wildlife Trust for enabling us to have our talks online. I'm Janet Knott, the secretary of the Sussex Wildlife Trust's Eastbourne Local Group, and I'm glad you can join us this evening. Uh, and I hope you'll enjoy, <clears throat> I'll hope, <laughs> I hope that you'll enjoy us to get a joy, oh, <laughs> got tongue tied, and hope that you'll join us again for our November talk, when the SWT's Chris Bentley will be giving us some great information about garden invertebrates and how to encourage them. Now for tonight's talk, about some of the hidden goings on at Rye Harbour reserve as the SWT's Dr Barry Yates shares his adventures with a trail cam. So over to Barry. Thank you Janet. Good evening everyone. So we're going to go on some adventures with uh, a trail camera around Rye Harbour Nature Reserve. The, uh, oh, can't even control this mouse. So here's a trail camera in a reed bed waiting for some wildlife to uh, come along to record it. And I've had some great times over the last few years using these little gadgets. But first of all, let's establish where we are. So in the far east of, the, of Sussex, um, there's this little triangle of land. And uh, this is where Rye Harbour Nature Reserve is. Um, if you visited before, you probably visited the southern part, which is owned by the Environment Agency and uh, it's all about salt water and uh, shingle habitats. And then there's the northern part, which is about freshwater and where the reed beds are. So there's all these facts about the nature reserve, but let's move on. So here's a trail camera. They're sort of handy sized. I should have put my hand in for, uh, for comparison. And they're amazing devices. So they're magical little boxes. Um, they're self-contained. You can have video or, or still images from them. They're weatherproof, but as I found out, not completely waterproof. Um, and they can see in the dark, which is always handy when looking for uh, elusive wildlife. And they're triggered by animal movement and they can record sound. And they can also be used to capture 
long time lapse over uh, several months. And we'll visit that at the end of the talk. So these little boxes open up and at first they can be a bit um, mystifying because there's all these buttons. Um, the most helpful one there is the on off. Um, and uh, the most important thing is to put it somewhere where the water level is not going to rise and flood it out. Um, I've lost a couple that way. They're not completely waterproof, as I said earlier. So there's three ways of using trail cameras. And so I don't forget what they are. I've written it down. Um, you can have photos triggered by the movement, or you can have videos triggered by the movement, plus you get the sound of the wildlife. Um, or photos taken at regular intervals to make a time lapse. But the one I'm going to concentrate most on this evening is the videos. Um, and some of the, the videos I'll be showing will also have sound that might be quite loud. Um, I know there's some very, very noisy uh, oyster catchers to come. So one of the problems is that uh, they don't, when you get them, they don't usually focus very close. So if you notice on this image at the top, there um, is a little bit of a lens just glued on with blue tack. There's a close up of it. This is extremely crude. And if uh, on my screen, it looks like this lens needs cleaning, but if you use a, a cheap plastic reading glasses and, and cut a section of the lens with a, with a fine saw, stick it on with blue tack, leave a little hole at the bottom to, to let moisture out. Um, this gives you um, a much better chance of, of getting close up images that are in focus. And it also throws the background out of focus, which uh, helps a little bit. So where are these adventures that you're all waiting for? Well, some are going to be in shallow pools, some in reed beds, some in grassland, and some in the saline lagoons. So at Rye Harbour, if you visited, and if you visit at high tide, you'll be familiar with the roosts of oyster catchers. And behind them in this picture, there's uh, some golden plovers roosting during the day. And I always wonder what it would be like to be in amongst these flocks. So quite a long time ago, I, I thought, let's get a trail camera, but they were quite primitive. So this is in 2012. This is what I thought was a wonderful recording. But the image quality wasn't good and the sound quality was awful. Um, but more recently, um, I found the, the Browning cameras to have really good video, high HD video, and the sound can be really good. Still get problems with, with wind, but here we are in amongst a, a roost of oyster catchers at Ternary Pool. They can be quite argumentative. Um, and this one's at the water's edge. And here's yet another one of oyster catchers. I think this one might be washing. Or did I cut the washing one out? That was a little group of widgeon. But this is what I wanted to show you was one of the other uses of the camera was to, to look at some of the color rings that are on birds.
so back in February, we, we learned that a, a Dutch colouring bird was had, uh, had been ringed as a chick um, near Amsterdam in uh, the summer of 2018. So if we move on to shallow pools, um, this video shows one of the, the things you really shouldn't do when you put a trail camera out, which is put it up a little bit crooked with all the, all the waters going downhill. Um, but here the target was the, uh, the breeding avocets. And they can be very argumentative, especially when they've got uh, chicks. So this was a few weeks later when the water level had gone down and had revealed a lot of mud. There's a little small chick at the back. And there's adults over here. I think there's another chick there. But look at all these flies around here. And the young, av the young avocet hasn't got the long curved bill, so it's just taking insects off the surface and and little shrimps. Um, another breeding bird, another breeding wader on these muddy pools um, are the lapwing. And this is quite a young chick. And this is the ideal habitat for, for, for lapwing chicks. Um, very wet mud. And they're looking for surface movement. It's full of little chironomid um, fly larvae. And other flies. And if you're really lucky, uh, those chicks grow up to be juveniles. So this is in the same pool, might even be the same chick. But this shallow water and muddy habitat is really um, at a premium here at Rye Harbour. And in recent years, it's become dominated by uh, a a non-native invasive weed called Australian swamp weed. Here's a, another breeding wader. These are my favorite birds, the breeding waders. And I, and I spent three years studying red shank, but I, I never got intimate views like this. But for red shank, the, the chicks are so well hidden that I've only got one video taken by the trail cameras of red shank chicks, um, but it's not a very pleasant one. So if you don't like the idea of a bird eating a bird, I should keep your eyes closed for the next uh, 20 seconds. It is early one morning, a grey heron has caught a red shank chick, and then it swallows it all in one go much to the distress of the, the adults moving away. So there are many threats to the wading birds. But after the breeding season, those same pools become the home of passage migrants. So on the left is a snipe, and on the right, a very fine and delicate sandpiper, a wood sandpiper. And if you're bird watchers, you'll realize that we never get such good views of wading birds um, behaving naturally. And here's uh, another pool. This is two different types of sandpiper. The one in the middle preening is a green sandpiper and the other two are wood sandpipers. And again, it's this shallow, muddy pool that's full of insects, it's undisturbed, and it is ideal for these birds that are migrating south and just need to refuel. Um, so in this clip of a, a shell duck at the edge of a, a shallow pool, um, 
it starts off at normal speed and then it's I repeat it and slow it down five times so that you can hear the, the intricacies of the, the voice of a shell duck. trying to think of what that sounds like. Um, to me, um, there's a bit of wildebeest in the, in the slowed down call of the, of the shell duck. Um, and here's another soundtrack taken from a trail camera. This is Grey Lag Goose. Again, this is uh, a roost of curlew, and, and this has got the slowing down treatment at the end. So to my ears, that sounds a little bit like uh, the, the calls of red-throated divers up in the, in the far north. So those curlew by day um, feed out on the, the wet pasture, the sheep graze pasture. And uh, by setting the, the camera up really low, you get a, an eye level perspective with these wading birds. And this and here, this is also with some starlings in the background. Look at the mud on the beak of the curlew. And I had several videos of curlews feeding right in front of this camera. And they always went for the same little um, hillocks. That was a fading, a favorite little probing area. They're after a nice juicy worm or leather jacket. And this is the same view, um, but this is a smaller version of the curlew. This is the wimbrel. The beak's not as long and the head's very stripy. I think this, does this one go for the same patch of ground? But that video didn't have much of a sound on it at all. Um, and I really like the sound of Wimbrel. It reminds me of uh, my time spent in Shetland. So earlier in the spring, um, this, this clip um, captures the, the seven notes of the Wimbrel. takes me right back to uh, a lovely summer spent in, uh, in Shetland. But it's not all about birds and uh, the same camera that you saw for the curlew and the first wimbrel, at night it also saw this.
And though I, although I love to see badgers, I also know that they are one of the biggest predators of the ground nesting birds on the wet grassland here at Rye Harbour. As is this character. So the cameras are illuminating at night with infrared. That although the animals aren't supposed to see them, uh, some I think some of them do know it's there. So here we are. The, the next phase of the adventure is is stepping into the reed beds, um, but with Wellingtons on. Um, so we've created a lot of reed bed habitat here at Rye Harbour and. Uh, it's maturing nicely. This little patch of reed bed is uh, within about 100 metres of where I'm sitting at the moment, so it's very easy to pop out and, and look after the cameras. And initially I was interested in the water voles. And you don't see them much, uh, but they're out there. And so I built this little raft and attached the camera to it so the camera could go up and down with the changing water levels. And this is one of its combined latrines and feeding stations. So all these white stems here are um, the shoots, the fresh growing shoots of, of reed um, that the water has collected from underwater and, and brought it to this little platform. It's quite a messy eater. So the cameras can take still shots as well, and I, and I thought I would experiment to see what time of day the water voles were active. And here's a graph. I'm not going to give any talks unless I can show at least one graph. Um, and the time of day is across the bottom. So the hours from 0 to 6 are in darkness, as are the, the hours of 17 to 23. And so during the winter, uh, the water voles were very um, nocturnal and it was a long time before um, I managed to capture one in daylight and, and in colour. And here's a colourful little ratty. This is the middle of winter and uh, you can see the, the shoots there of the of the reed are, are fresh and green. And I wonder whether if you had a lot of water voles in a, in a reed bed they would um, help control the, uh, the vigour of, of the reeds. But uh, I don't think we have enough water voles for that here yet. But on the, on the raft there were also these little brown birds this is a, a Chetty's warbler that's caught a water boatman. Um, not a lot of terrestrial insects in the middle of winter, uh, but plenty of, of pond life. And the Chetty's warblers stay with us all year round. They breed here and they winter here. And uh, a water boatman is, is quite a tasty mouthful. So I then experimented with adding the uh, little plastic lenses on the front and got this closer view of a Chetty's warbler, but still eating a, a water boatman. Look at their lovely little pink legs of the, of the Chetty's warblers and the rich chestnut colour on the back. A bit of an eye stripe, black stripe going through the eye and a pale stripe over the eye. Mm, that looks very tasty, delicious water boatman. I think the Chetty's warblers have to be careful in dealing with them because uh, they can give a nasty bite. I've been bitten several times by water boatmen. So in the reed bed, I decided I would um, have a special effort to try and follow one of the most elusive of our breeding birds, the, the water rails. So I, I cut a little arena, only about 
just over a meter square, banged in a post and uh, put in a trail camera and then put in another one. And uh, there was a whole series of wildlife at first. This is in the winter, you can, so there's a robin and there's a wren. A Chetty's warbler. A young moorhen, about the size of its feet. But it was a long time. Oh, and uh, not forgetting the water voles. And this stone became very popular. That's a field mouse. This is a water shrew. It was such a popular stone. That it was like a magnet for the reed bed wildlife. But not at first for water rails. And then, lo and behold, one came to show itself. It's got even bigger feet. So that, that was a highlight. I thought I had succeeded, but I left the trail cameras running. And then this one's a bit fuzzy, this image, because uh, the camera's damp. But this water rail was collecting nesting material. Keep coming back. The same place, collecting the leaves of the, of the reeds time and time again. This isn't on an endless loop. This is all, uh, oh, and, and that one was walking by with a, with a fish. That's a stickleback it's caught there. So this pair were obviously um, feeding up to produce eggs, but one day I came to the trap, the trail camera, and um, found a predated egg and I, I'd given up. And then, And then I saw something that I'd never seen before, which was the, the cute black chips with white beaks of the water rail. But they were very, very secretive at first, not coming out into the open. Just got little glimpses, like looking into a, a dense forest. One swimming, two swimming. So we, we thought we had a couple of water rail chicks on there just being fed, but you could hardly see it in the dense undergrowth. And they were getting bigger and bigger. Still only seeing two at a time. Now, this one's grown quite a bit larger now. Not looking quite so fluffy. But still liking to hide away. Don't forget we've got lots of marsh harriers, so it's not very sensible if you're a ground dwelling bird to venture out into the open. This chick's looking up all the time. Perhaps I should have put a trail camera facing up. Now yeah, that one went and caught his own food. And then the water level dropped and, and the rock became uh, more visible. This was a nice shot with the two adults preening each other with one chick beneath. I 
I think this is called aloe preening. I might have made that up. And then this was quite an exciting little clip. A chicken and adult on the rock and a grass snake nearby. I think the grass snake just wanted somewhere warm and sunny to uh, to sunbathe. And then when the chicks were a little bit larger, it turned out there were three of them. Not very pretty little things, but quite adventurous, quite good at climbing in the reeds. and they were rarely being attended by the adults. And as it turned out, the adults had uh, started another brood. They, was, they, they laid some, other, some eggs in another nest. And uh, yeah, we saw a, a second brood. But the thing that eluded me for nearly a whole year was to capture the, the sound and the sight of a water rail doing its piglet squealing in, in the reeds. So when you watch this video, I hope you'll be able to hear a distant water rail first, and then the bird in the picture responds. And this is slowed down to five times. That's usually all you hear in the uh, in the reed beds is the squealing of the, of the uh, water rails. So what's the next uh, target for, for, for trail cameras in the reed beds? I'd really like to improve on, on this video, which when I start it, well, you can see already it's a bittern. Um, it's one of the reasons, the main reason that we created the reed bed area at Castle Water, but we rarely see them. Um, so I think I might have a, another go. So this is from the 2012 version of the trail camera, which is not great quality. Um, and the bittern wasn't very well trained. Perhaps if I put a giant rock in front of the trail camera, the, I, can, I can train the bitterns like the water rails have been trained to uh, perform on there. So this is a little section of, of using the, the cameras for, for, for time lapse. Um, the advantage of these cameras is that they're weatherproof and the, the batteries will last for months if you just set them to take a few photographs each day. And then you can stitch the photographs together to make a little film. So I forget which is the first one. Oh. So this is a time lapse of uh, a lovely sunrise about a year ago, which is taken on an ordinary camera. But the, the, the problem is you can only set this to run for a, sort of three hours at the most. And, and I wanted to capture changes that took longer. So this is a, a salt marsh tide. So this is a, about eight hours in the life of a salt marsh. high tide coming and then going out. When I put this on social media, several people suggested that it looked like the, the salt marsh was breathing. So it's gonna breathe in 
and then breathe out. And that seawater coming into the salt marsh is bringing life and, uh, and food to, to all the plants and animals that, that live there. So this um, next time lapse is about the reed bed developing in spring. So this is over three months. The, the lighting on it is very flickery um, and it takes a bit of a while to get going. So this is in March. The reed bed is still looking very brown and the willow trees are just twigs. And in April, the willow trees have, have gr are greening up a little bit, but the reed bed is still looking very dull and lifeless. But now in May, it bursts into life and right at the end, everything starts growing in June. Even the little camera, even the little tree that I'd strapped the, the camera to. But it wasn't very smooth. And then neither's the next one. So this is the, the life of a sea kale in 120 days. This is very flickery. And the, the mistake I made was not to use a big fence post to, to strap the camera to, because it looks like the wind was blowing the small post that I did uh, strap the trail camera to. So here we go, 120 days in, in the life of a sea kale. So this is sort of starting in February and they were just emerging out of the ground and flower and seeds. And uh, I'm glad I didn't sit there for 120 days pressing the shutter once a day because the result wasn't really what I wanted. Um, so I thought I would try and summarize some of the important things about using a trail camera. So before you leave a trail camera, check that the settings are correct. Um, one of my time lapses um, I went back to after three months and uh, I'd set it on video mode rather than photo mode. So that was a bit disappointing. That the battery is fully charged, that the memory card is fitted correctly and that it's empty, that the lens is clean. These are all mistakes I've made. That the camera is set vertically. Um, and I've got a little tiny little spirit level I use now. The last thing I do when I set the camera is just check that it's level. But most important of all, double check that you've turned it on before you leave it. There's nothing more um, upsetting than leaving a camera for a fortnight and coming back to it to find it's been turned off all that time. So that was going to be the end of, of my, my talk about the trail cameras. But um, I went and checked them this morning and I found two videos that I thought were vaguely interesting. This one's about animals that I haven't featured so far today. This was uh, taken three days ago. It's a pair of common darters in the bottom left hand corner there that are laying eggs. The male has got hold of the, the female's head or her neck and um, is making sure that no other males mate with her and that he's dictating where the eggs are laid because of course he knows best. It's in the little glade where the water rails have been active. And then just recently the water rails have been manic in front of the, the camera. They've been washing about and jumping and yeah, just very, very active. But they've always been alone just recently. And I thought perhaps they, they, they spent their whole time alone. But no, here's a pair or two birds quite happily living together. No animosity. Um, and I like to think this is the the pair of adults that produce those chicks. So there we are, that's my adventures with the trail camera. And I uh, just ending on a photo I took this morning down at the Discovery Center. Um, a fantastic uh, sunrise. Um, I think that the sunrises we get in October are, are often the best. You get dramatic underlighting of the clouds. 
And uh, yeah, that's where I was this morning. Thank you. Are you still there, Michael? I'm still there, Barry. That was, yeah, uh, that was fantastic. Thank you. I loved all that. I love the, uh, you know, the water owl is my favourite bird, so I, I, I could watch hours of that sort of footage. Amazing. <laughs> well, that's one, one of the that's problems, a... Michael, that's one of the problems of a trail camera is you end up with hours of video. Yeah. Definitely. And, uh, yeah. Wasn't too impressed that the, the slow down grey lag geese sounded absolutely terrifying. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. awful. So um, I've got some questions, Barry. Are you okay for some questions? Yes, go ahead. I've got a few here. Um, well, Sam asked first of all. Yes, some great footage of wood sandpipers. And uh, Sam said, um, "Did you know the wood sandpipers were going to be there?" Um, I hoped. You always hope that you're going to put the camera in a good place. So select somewhere where other people aren't going to see it. So I've got quite a lot of choice within our fencing to, 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 to put the camera in many different places. But those very shallow pools with um, lots of soft mud are very popular with many wading birds. So it is completely potluck. And uh, yeah, by looking through hours of videos, you can pick out the best ones where the birds stay in view for longest. Um, and you mentioned about the wood sandpiper, so you never get good views of wood sandpipers. Uh, and someone's asked, uh, why is that? Is it because they're scared of people or scared of crowds or? Uh... Yes, they, they are very jumpy little birds. First of all, they're not very common. Um, and this autumn, we had very few around. I think those videos were I showed of the wood sandpiper were last year or the year before. Um, but yeah, so some birds are very jumpy. Some wading birds like um, green shank and wood sandpiper just will not tolerate people very close. Whereas birds like the red shank at Rye Harbour have got used to people walking along the footpaths. And you can watch them very close behaving naturally um, with binoculars or telescopes because they get used to the predictability of, of people. Okay, thank you. Um, there's some technical questions here. Um, now, Marion asked, uh, you mentioned you get hundreds and hundreds of little clips. Do you, uh, do you have problems with like the, the reeds waving around and setting the camera off? Yeah, sometimes. So certain angles of the sun that seem to affect um, the vegetation so that they, they set off the camera, as do some waves. So when I've set it next to, to water and it's been windy, um, you get endless videos of moving waves. Not very exciting, but it only seems to be a certain time of day. Uh, okay, Christine asks, uh, do you have any tips for avoiding lens condensation or steaming up? Yeah, I've got um, a lens cleaner, which a clean lens is not so, um, doesn't steam up so quickly. There is, I'm trying to think of the name, there is a substance you can get to, to put on lenses, um, but I haven't bothered with it. Um, oh, no, I can't think of it. It's got a strange okay, uh, name. D D David asks, uh, would you ever use drones? And if so, would they disturb the birds? Yeah, drones are an increasing problem for the nature reserve, but we do use them ourselves. Um, so generally, if they're flown above 200 feet, uh, most birds ignore them. Uh, but some oyster catchers are particularly sensitive to drones and will go up and challenge them. Um, but we've been using drones this summer to count the numbers of nests of cormorants and uh, little egrets. And in a previous year, we used them to count Mediterranean gulls and sandwich terns. Although on that occasion, we kept so high, we couldn't really make um, reliable counts of the nests, but it's a very useful tool, but uh, needs to be used responsibly. Um, 
Anna asks, how much do these cameras cost? Um, well, I've got some cheap ones at uh, about £80, but the, the Brownings are probably just over £200 each. And uh, yeah, like all things, I think you get what you pay for. Uh, well, I think that's, uh, oh yeah, so there's a few questions here. Um, how long do the batteries last uh, and how, some Fiona and Paula said, how long do you leave the camera before checking it? Okay, well, if, if it's taking photos, um, often you can, you can leave it for a month or so and the, the batteries will be fine. Um, if, the, if it's really cold weather, the battery life isn't so good. But for the videos, I, I generally put a, a large memory card in, 32 gigabytes, and, and leave it for a fortnight. And it's very exciting, um, as long as you remember to have switched the camera on. And at that point, Steve's asked, uh, how long do you typically uh, leave a camera for before it's accepted by wildlife and you start getting footage? Yeah, so with those videos right at the beginning, um, the, the oyster catchers and the golden plovers were a little bit put off by them and they, they roosted further away. But after a few days, they, they forgot about them and, and moved, moved close. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for your questions. Well, there's a lot of uh, lovely comments here. It was says magnificent, absolutely awesome. So uh, I'll pass those uh, compliments on to uh, to Barry later on. So, uh, so thank you, Barry. Uh, if you stop sharing your screen, maybe I can I can share mine. Uh, okay. And uh, it's going to work. Is that working, Barry? Yep. That's it's been good. a while since I've done this. So yeah. So uh, so thank you to Barry. And uh, just as as always, just finish the uh, the evening by looking at some of the talks that are, that are coming up in the. Uh, uh, in the future on the uh, SWT TV, uh, there is a talk by a conversation with Professor Martin Bell and Dr. Tony Woodbread looking at rewilding, a brand new idea for a recreation of the past. That's going to be quite a popular talk on Tuesday, October the 26th, next Tuesday. And uh, a week today is a talk uh, about crustaceans, habitat and sediment movement. I know our marine talk is always really popular, so uh, to book for that one, that's uh, Casey and Therese. Uh, next next week, next Thursday. And then we're hosting a talk by the Sussex Ornithological Society, the SOS. Uh, there'll be uh, a talk by Stephen Egerton Reed about the white tailed eagle reintroduction to southern England. You seen any of those over Rye Harbour, Barry? Uh, just occasionally, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and then Barry's colleague, uh, Chris, Chris from over at Rye, Chris Bentley, will be doing a talk uh, about garden invertebrates and how to encourage them. Uh, on Thursday, 18th of November. So if you enjoy this evening's uh, webinar, we always say uh, please to show your appreciation by making a donation to support the, uh, the Wildlife Trust. There'll be a chance to do that afterwards. Uh, really appreciate all the donations that have been made in the past year. If you're not a member, again, uh, me and Barry usually make threats to come around and knock on your door because we know where you live now. Uh, so consider joining us and there'll be a chance to join on our website. There'll be a link to that uh, later on. And if you click, uh, there should be I'm never sure this works or not, but uh, hopefully I'll set it up properly. It means that when, when the uh, webinar finishes, there'll be uh, a page on your, on your browser, which have links to uh, some more Barry's videos, information about Rye Harbour, as well as links to uh, upcoming wildlife talks and how to register, as well as a chance to donate and, uh, and join the trust. So we've had a nice crowd tonight, Barry. So a big thank you again to Barry. Usually, as I always say, uh, there'll be lots of people uh, applauding and clapping tonight, Barry, but uh, unfortunately, you have to make do with uh, some clapper boards instead this evening. So thanks thank again you. to Barry. And uh, thank you to everyone out there for the continued support of the Wildlife Trust. Thank you for watching. And uh, we'll see you again soon. So uh, give us a wave, Barry. <laughs> Take care. Cheers, folks. Cheers, Michael. Bye. Bye.